or this? Would you recognize those as flowers? Or how about these? And these funny looking things, would you call those flowers? Now we do have some flowers in Australia that are the right sort of shape, at least they're round and they do have some things that look like petals. And those ones are, right, are the right shape. But have you ever felt one of these? They're not called paper daisies for nothing. They really do feel hard and papery. And these ones aren't called flannel flowers for nothing. Have you ever felt one? They're beautiful. They're lovely and soft. They're just like flannel. So the early explorers, they looked at the wildlife in Australia. They looked at the plants and the animals. And remember in the um, 1700s, this was before the theory of evolution had become a big thing. And they thought, well, these plants and these animals are so strange, they had to be a separate creation. They had to be made differently from all of the other plants and animals around the world. And uh, this, this is actually a book written by um, a, a fellow named Graham Pizzi who collected some of the writings of the early explorers. And it's most interesting, and one of the early explorers that he collected the writings for in the descriptions of uh, Australia was Charles Darwin. Now we know Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos Islands in South America. He did actually come to Australia. He visited Sydney. He was not impressed with the place. Uh, I'll leave you Brisbane people to decide whether you want to agree with him or not. I don't live in Sydney, so I can be neutral. <laughs> um, but anyway, Charles Darwin came to Australia in 1836 and he looked around at the, uh, the plants and the animals, the wildlife in Australia, and he sort of mused to himself. He kept a diary. He was a great writer and we have a lot of his writings. He was a great writer in terms of that he was prolific. Um, we have some other opinions about the content of his writing, but, but we know how he thought because he wrote a lot of his own thoughts down. And this is one of the things that he wrote as he was observing the strange wildlife in Australia. An unbeliever in everything beyond his own reason might exclaim, surely two distinct creators must have been at work. Now remember this was early in Darwin's life. He had just finished his university uh, degree, right, in arts and theology, and he was very much of the culture of his own uh, background. He was an English gentleman. And in fact, that's why he was invited to go on that uh, voyage around the world. He was a gentleman naturalist. So he was well versed in the culture and that's what people thought. They still had the mindset that God was somewhere behind what we see out there in the, in the creation. So this is early in his life, 1836. And he went on to think, well, maybe this wasn't two distinct creators. He wrote, a geologist perhaps would suggest that the periods of creation had been distinct and remote the one from the other. Now what he means is that the things in Europe and America that he had seen were created at a different time, many years between that and when the things in Australia were created because he'd been reading a book by uh, Charles Lyell who was the one who uh, wrote about um, slow, gradual processes proving supposedly proving that the earth was millions of years old. Now we've just had a very interesting presentation <laughs> which shows you that those uh, slow gradual processes aren't so slow and so gradual if they are preserved the things that we actually see in the fossil record, the things that we go out and see in the real world. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight in Australia. What do we actually see in the real world? Does it fit with uh, Darwin's ideas? So after 1836, Darwin spent a couple of decades thinking about um, his ideas about where living things came from, how they had changed, how long the earth had been here. He drew that little diagram on the left, which is probably the first evolutionary tree that we have recorded, and eventually wrote this book, which we know as The Origin of Species, but it actually has a much longer name. Now, they were rather verbose in Victorian England. So, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or 
the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. And that's not even the most verbose name that Dao, he wrote many books and that's not even the most verbose title, but it's fairly verbose by our standards. But let's analyse it because this is the mindset we've got. If natural selection is real, therefore evolution is real because Darwin has linked those two things, the origin of living things with natural selection. So let's go back to Australia. Why do we have strange plants and animals and things in Australia? Well, Darwin's idea became well embedded in our culture. Australia is at the end of the earth. It's been separated for millions of years from the rest of the world. Therefore, the plants and animals must have evolved here. So how do we find answers? Well, there are some interesting answers that have been suggested in the um, scientific literature fairly recently, and it's all to do with the birds and the bees. You've heard of the birds and the bees? <laughs> all right. We don't have plants like this. We have rather odd-looking plants. Now, here is uh, an article from the ABC. All right. Aussie bees drove flower evolution. So we have strange looking flowers that aren't round because of our bees. How does that work? Okay, flowers in Australia have evolved their bright colours to attract native bees. And the logic is the bees' colour vision somehow evolved by chance three to four hundred million years ago. Australian plants have been separated from other plants 34 million years ago, and you can look this up on the ABC, that's why I showed you that screenshot. We're not inventing this, this is what they say. Right, the flowers in Australia started out as quote unquote simple plain structures without pigment. In other words, they were simple things without any colours. And this is from their articles, however, since then, many brightly coloured and interestingly shaped flowers have evolved on the island continent as the result of the pressure to attract pollinators. Which leads us to ask a question. How do the eyes of bees create genes for flower colour in plants? Because what they're saying is that the bees could see colour, the plants didn't have any colour. But because the bees could see colour and the plants needed the bees to pollinate them, the, bees, the flowers evolved colour. How does that work? Now, the other reason, or there are two other reasons, that we are supposed to have such weird plants in Australia is that our plants are often pollinated by uh, small mammals, uh, like this cute little possum or these rather lovely birds. And therefore, a lot of our flowers are large and bright red. And so here's another recent story from the ABC of their News in Science. Um, that's, uh, they have a, sec a separate website called News in Science, and that's where you get all of these things. All right. <clears throat> flowers bloom for honey eaters. What's the logic here? All right. What they did is, they, uh, some scientists studied the colour of bird pollinated flowers. We know that many of the flowers that are observed to be pollinated by birds. And they compared those colours with the colours that birds can see. Now we know what colours that birds can see because we can actually analyse their eyes and look at the cells in their eyes that are responsive to, to different colours. And they can work out what colours the birds see best. And it's not actually the same as what humans can see. It's slightly different. But they decided, all right, we'll see how the birds would see these flowers. And they found about half the bird pollinated flower species had a colour value that would have stood out to the birds with the honey eater colour vision system because different birds see colours in slightly different uh, ways, right? They're more sensitive to some wavelengths along the, along the light spectrum. So they thought, oh wow, isn't that great? These, uh, these flowers have just the right sort of colour for the honey eaters to see. Isn't that good? Well, that is good. And it works. But is this true? It's the best evidence to date to support the conventional wisdom that flower colour evolves 
in response to the visual system preferences of pollinators. In other words, the flowers are that particular shade of red because the honey eater's eyes are very good at seeing that particular shade of red. So we need to ask another question. How do the eyes of honey eaters create genes for flower colour in plants? The system works, but does it work by this method that we've just been told? And then finally, the reason we have such strange plants in Australia, well, Australia is a very harsh, dry place, full of poor soils and poor rainfall. So our plants had to evolve to be tough so that they could grow in the desert. And we don't call these desert peas for nothing. Aren't they wonderful? They're sturt desert peas just growing out there. And these were supposed to evolve to protect the in, inner parts of the flower from the harsh sunlight. And we know that they do grow well in Western Australia where there is a lot of harsh sunlight. But is that what made them that shape? Or have they just survived because they already had that shape? Those two things aren't the same. So we can ask this question, did God create Australia with a harsh climate so we could have weird plants? <laughs> well, you would think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> if you had Charles Darwin's mindset. So how do we find the truth? In all things, we have two things. We need to know what the Bible actually says, and a lot of skeptics don't. So if someone said, oh, the Bible says something or other, well, um, look that up and see what the Bible actually says. This might be the first time that skeptic actually opens a Bible and reads it. So what a great opportunity. After all, the word of God's living and active. Right? So know what the scripture actually says. And don't be afraid to check out the science. Now you might think, well, I can't do that. Well, these days there are lots of wonderful resources. Uh, check out, just read the normal scientific news and we do try and help you do that. We have a newsletter where we trawl the normal scientific news that comes out on the general services. That's how we found the ABC articles. And we also have a place that, that uh, we've called Jurassic Ark. John showed you a few photos of that. And what we've decided to do is plant some gardens so that people can see the evidence here and now in the real world, because God is the God of the real world. He's not the God of theological theory or of personal fulfillment. He's the God of the real world, and this helps people to see that. So you can go and look in our gardens, and we will show you some of the evidence that the Bible, what the Bible says is true. Now, in the first session, you heard about after their kind. So we have planted lots of uh, plants. Some of these uh, are not Australian plants, and some of them are. And so we have some ordinary garden plants that you might be familiar with. We have a few more exotic ones. Now, it's interesting, isn't this, isn't this beautiful? This is an orchid. Isn't it a beautiful colour? And it's, isn't it an interesting shape? And yet evolution says that all flowering plants originally evolved from an ordinary round flower. And here we have this very complicated shape. Now, if that's true, this has not evolved after its kind, but if it's always been like that, it has evolved, it has multiplied after its kind. And we have some very little native plants. This is a really cute little lily. It's sort of only about as big as the thumbnail. And of course, we have the iconic plant of Australia, some huge gum trees. So let's have a look at what's up a gum tree. Now, what is distinctive about gum trees? Well, everyone can recognise a gum tree. You don't have to be a biologist. We know what's distinctive about them. They have leaves with these waxy surfaces and resins, and um, you can smell the uh, eucalyptus oil. It's wonderful stuff. And uh, where do we get that name, eucalyptus? It actually comes from two Greek words, eu, which means well or good, and calyptos, which means cover. So eucalyptus means well covered. So what is well covered in a gum tree? It's actually the, plant, uh, the uh, flowers. All right, so here we have a bunch of flower buds and you can see they've got quite a thick covering over them. 
right? So that is the eucalyptus, the well covering. It's uh, what makes the gum trees um, <clears throat> distinctive uh, compared with a lot of other plants. And the way these bloom is that that bud will grow and eventually the top of that covering will start to come apart, right? It will actually, um, it will become thin and it will form uh, a dehiscence or a, 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 a cut around it and the top will fall off and out will come your lovely gum blossoms. And there they are, nicely opened. And in spite of the fact these are imported bees rather than Australian bees, they love them just as much as the uh, um, uh, Australian, Australian bees. And they also love them as much as the possums and the bird because they have lots of, um, lots of nectar, don't they? You can actually smell it in some gum trees. You can smell the sweetness. Uh -huh. Now, eventually those will be fertilised in some way and all of those uh, red stamens will fall off and it will start to form seeds and they will just grow from the base until we have our familiar gum nuts. And when the seeds are ready, they're very, very tiny little seeds. Uh, the, uh, at the base of the gum nuts, uh, the, um, there's a little valve that opens and the seeds are so light they actually blow away. Now we can observe this process happening over and over again. Now here is the whole process. We have the gum blossoms opening there on the left and on the right you can see a bunch of gum nuts. We observe that process and what do we get? More gum trees. You can believe that gum trees used to be seaweed if you like, but our observations are that gum trees produce gum trees. Right? And I'm not joking, the theory of evolution is that all plants were originally algae, uh, right? that's like seaweed in the sea, and somehow some plants sort of migrated onto land, and they became mosses and little plants like that, and eventually became uh, larger plants and flowering plants were the last ones to, to have evolved. Now you can believe that if you like, but we haven't observed that. What we have observed, and we observe this with all plants, is that plants reproduce after their kind. We depend on that. That is what farmers do. We depend on our crop plants reproducing after their kind. It's absolutely essential to life on earth. So that is one of the reasons God has built that into uh, our whole living system. Now let's compare that with Darwin's view. Now notice that Darwin says origin of species, not kinds. Those things are not the same. And down at Jurassic Arc, we have actually planted some examples of the gum tree kind. Now, we tried to plant about 40 different ones, but there are actually hundreds of species of gum trees, but they are all obviously gum trees. Now, they vary in the sorts of pigments they have, in the size of the flowers, in the sort of resins, in their growth habits. But they are all very clearly gum trees. So let's consider Darwin's idea that they got here by natural selection. Did they evolve here or were they selected? Now you might think that's an odd question, but there is a difference between something evolving and something being selected. Now, simple English test, the word selection, what does that mean? as a plain English word, and don't let anyone ever bluff you with any sort of jargon, and certainly don't let them belt you over the head with any big words. Uh, but uh, be careful when people are using just what ought to be plain English words in a jargon form. So selection, to select something means to choose between already existing alternatives. You can't select something that doesn't exist. It's not there. That means that selection will not make new kinds of plants. All it can do is eliminate the unfit kinds. In other words, it can choose some of them to survive and some of them to die. And so that's why natural selection is sometimes called survival of the fittest. So let's go back to Australia. We certainly do have a harsh, dry climate where a lot of plants just couldn't grow. 
And uh, some of you, I'm sure, are gardeners and you've tried to grow some plants in Australia's harsh, dry climate and had, a, had some trouble. These things can grow in the desert, but some other things can't. So these things win in Darwin's struggle for life. But is that because they evolved there from an ordinary round flower that normally grows in an English-type climate, or is it because they already had those features that would enable them to survive? And the same with the kangaroo paws. And these things, well, what's the politically correct name for these? <laughs> all right, grass trees. I do remember when they were called black boys, but all right, grass trees is fine. And, the, <laughs> and grass trees are so, are so tough, they will survive fires and drought. Well, we have lots of fires and drought in Australia, so they win in the struggle for existence but other things lose out. And so let's go back to the gum trees. This is your typical gum tree type bushland. Uh, I learnt in geography this was classified as dry sclerophyll forest. Not very inviting, is it? <laughs> right. Compared with the forests of England, this, this is a wood in England. I loved walking in the woods in England. It, it's just so beautiful. The ground doesn't scrunch under your feet because the earth is lovely and soft and you get this lovely green... Uh, soft light and you don't have any ticks and snakes to worry about either. <laughs> it really was lovely. But let's go back to what Darwin is saying, <clears throat> is saying about how this all happened and compare it with what the Bible says. Okay, know what the science is claiming, know what the scriptures say and check out the science, in other words, what we actually observe. Now notice Darwin says on the origin of species, now the second part of his name, of his book title, usually gets left out. People sort of uh, collapse after the origin of species, right? The preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. Now is preservation the same as origin? Darwin wasn't too good at English, was he, for an Englishman? <laughs> Very interesting that the, uh, er, the early uh, people in Darwin's time uh, who took up his theory were not actually the scientists. They were the, um, the, the politicians and the lawyers. Uh, that Charles Lyell, the one I mentioned, he was the geologist of the Long Age. He, he was actually a lawyer. He got involved in politics. Uh, Darwin was a... The you know, we, we've been bluffed by a bunch of theologians and politicians and lawyers. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> okay, so the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. Does that sound like what Genesis says? Now remember the problem with the school chaplains? We have to let God, let the students believe God used evolution. But God said that everything he made was very good. A struggle for life is not very good. So we need to look at what is the real history of the world according to Genesis. Yes, the world did start out very good and we had things multiplying after their kind and there was no struggle. But natural selection is not very good either. I mean, it sounds innocuous, natural selection, but it only works if the unfit die out. But in Genesis, it was good. After their kind, no struggle and no extinction. Why would God make something that was going to be selected out and go extinct? That's not good. That's because this is not the whole story, is it? Very sadly, this is a mural from our uh, Jurassic Ark site. As well as having gardens and fossils to look at, we have some murals designed by some of the artists who work with us. And, of course, we know that our first parents rebelled against their creator. God judged the world. He cursed the ground. And later on, the world was just so corrupt that God sent the flood to destroy the world. So the real history of the world is creation to degeneration. We live in the world of sin and judgment. The world is going downhill. Now, the after their kind is still there. That's how God made things for our benefit to multiply after their kind. But we live in a world that has been corrupted by sin and judgment. So struggle to survive, natural selection and extinction, those are all real processes. We do observe them. There's no doubt about that. 
So when the scientists say, yes, we've found evidence of natural selection, they're not making that up. But that is not how God created. That is what's happened to the world after it was finished and after we rebelled against our creator and he had to judge the world so that we would know there was something wrong and that we needed a saviour. So the world has definitely changed. There's no doubt about that. But it has not evolved. So let's have a look at the effects of the flood. The flood was sent in judgment and the environment was never the same after that, was, was it? From now on, there would be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, extremes of temperature. God told Noah that after the flood. And by Job's time, we read about drought and snow. And we have both in Australia. We definitely have drought and we do have snow. And the gum trees are able to cope in both, but not every species, not every member of the whole kind, right? Remember, 700 varieties of gum trees, we only planted about 40, and believe me, we have struggled to keep them alive. Uh, this, this place is up in Gympie where the soil is very poor and the climate is very harsh, and uh, we started this project in the middle of a drought, and we also had to put up with a few marauding goats and various other hazards. And on top of that, we also had a flood. <laughs> so yes, the struggle for existence is definitely real. <laughs> these uh, gum trees have survived all by themselves. And these are the type that uh, survive in hot, dry climates. They won in the struggle for life because other things didn't win. And uh, one of the ways they do that is that they shed their tough leaves uh, which are so tough they just stop other things from growing. These are snow gums. They can live in the snowy parts of the, uh, uh, of the high mountains because they have these lovely flexible stems uh, that aren't broken when piles of snow uh, land on them and they bend over and the nice waxy leaves allow the snow to slide off. Now, did they survive? because they ended up in this cold climate and they suddenly had to evolve flexible stems or because they already had them and other things didn't. So they survived, they won in the struggle for life. The struggle for life, natural selection, definitely real. They didn't evolve here, they just survived. And we know that from, the, um, from evidence from around the world. Gum trees will grow in much more gentle, kinder climates where there's a bit more moisture. They will grow in the misty rainforests. You can find them in New Guinea and they will grow in uh, Sulawesi and uh, um, those sort of regions as well. Uh, but they have to compete with a lot of other plants there so they don't dominate the landscape. But they can survive this. So they could have lived in the original good world where a mist rose up and watered the environment. Wouldn't that be lovely? And the other interesting thing is there's been a recent report about the oldest known eucalypt macro fossils. Now, this is the name of a scientific paper, oldest known eucalyptus macro fossils. That means fossils that are big enough to be seen without a microscope are from where? <laughs> South America. True. And uh, these scientists published this uh, paper in this journal, PLOS One, Public Library of Science One, quite recently. And here are the fossils they found. The, these are their slides uh, provided by the journal. Just look like gum trees, don't they? And gum flowers and buds. All right, this is called an infructescence. That's actually a posh name for a bunch of gum nuts. <laughs> Now, what does that tell us? Now, here is some real science. They did a really good job pulling out these fossils, uh, looking at them, photographing them, writing that up. This is good science, but what does it prove? Does it prove evolution? What does it prove? Well, if these really are the oldest eucalypts, and uh, well, let's be kind. Well, so, all right, you guys have found the oldest eucalypts. Um, that raises a whole other issue as to how they would work that out. But if they were, all that would prove is that the oldest eucalypts are the same as living eucalypts, so they've multiplied after their kind, no matter how long you want to make them live there. But eucalypts no longer grow in South America unless they're imported. Natural selection has eliminated them. So natural selection is real, but it doesn't make living things evolve. 
It allows some living things to survive and others die out. The world has definitely changed, but it has not evolved. Those are real processes, but they are part of the degeneration of the world. They are not part of the creation. God didn't use those processes to create. What he made was very good. He made things to multiply after their kind, but the world has been spoiled. And so those processes that we do see out in the real world are there, but they are part of the degeneration. So Australian plants, yes, we have after their kind, just as Genesis says. We do have natural selection, but not as Darwin says. But as we observe out there in the real world, we live in a wonderful country. It's not the Garden of Eden. We can say that the world has changed, but it definitely has not evolved. The world has gone downhill and that's to remind us we are fallen creatures in need of a saviour and isn't it marvellous that he sent one. So let's uh, finish there. Uh, we are supposed to finish at nine o'clock so I have run out of time. I'm sorry I've been as verbose as Darwin. <laughs> if you would like to ask some questions I am quite happy to answer them but if any of you are desperate for a cup of tea or coffee or to look at the wonderful display of books and DVDs we have up the back there uh, please uh, go and do that uh, but I would be happy to answer any, any questions. Uh, if anyone would like a question that they'd like the, everyone else to uh, listen to we still have the microphones down the front um, otherwise come and have a chat uh, come and talk to John, to Craig, to any of the creation research team. Have some tea or coffee and uh, have a look at our books and DVDs. You may find that some of the questions that I have raised are actually answered in some of our DVDs or on some of our websites and we'd be very happy to direct you to those sort of resources. So thank you all for coming and I do hope you can come tomorrow. Tomorrow will be uh, Ken Ham and John Mackay in the afternoon and Ken Ham in the evening. And tomorrow afternoon, uh, John's going to talk about fossils. So he'll be following up his talk uh, on fossils today, but he's going to talk about them in the context of the flood. So we're going on with the real history of the real world, creation uh, to flood, creation to degeneration. And the evidence is all there, that that's the real history of the real world. So thank you for coming and hopefully we will see you uh, for the next part of the weekend.